Hello, I'm Sarah. I'm highly intimidated by you all, not just the speakers, but everyone here as well. I've been having a look at some of your name tags going, oh my word, that's that woman I've been seeing her work of and might be too nervous to speak to, but really excited about the breakout sessions tomorrow so I can hear what you're all thinking and saying and have a good chat with you all. Um, thanks so much to Anne for letting me stand here and I would hopefully some of this you might get something out of it, it might provoke you to disagree with me um, but I'd love to get all your feedback on it in the breaks and chat about it as part of the breakout sessions as well. Um, I'm standing here as an activist really, not as an academic at all, not as a very good crafts person because I never went to art school or I only learned craft from YouTube, so um, not great at all. But I've always been an activist. I grew up in a low-income area in Everton, in Liverpool, um, surrounded by inequality under a Thatcher government and um, a militant council as well in the UK. So it was pretty tough times, and always seen how hard people work in the area, but also how they couldn't fulfil their potential because of structures um, keeping them poor or structures stopping them from fulfilling their potential. So I've always had a burning desire to help people be their best selves and to see and um, to sort of support other vulnerable people so that's always been in my heart but about four years ago um, I felt completely burnt out as an activist and for me identifying myself as an activist that was really scary you know I grew up as an activist I was squatting in local housing aged five with the local community to save family homes I was voted head girl from my peers in school and campaigned for lockers and won them, campaigned to eradicate gym knickers, lost that fight, <laughs> <laughs> um, but learned a lot about how to get the right people on your side. So with the lockers, we got a governor on our side to champion the campaign. With the gym knickers, the PE teachers would not have any of it, so we, we lost that campaign. But learned a lot, and I'm really keen to keep learning how to change the world and make it a better place with people. Um, and I've been lucky enough that my whole professional career, I've been a campaigner, I've worked for large charities, engaging people in global issues and helping them become activists. But like I said, three years ago, I felt completely burnt out and thought, actually, maybe activism isn't for me. I'm not a natural extrovert, which is why you can probably hear my voice shaking a little bit. I don't like shouting at people, I don't like telling people what to do, I don't like dressing up, I don't like waving placards, and actually being in groups really drains me. I like doing things on my own or in small groups. Um, so I thought, well, maybe traditional activism just isn't for me and I have to not do it. And then I thought, hang on a minute, that's awful. Um, and at the same time, I got into craft because I used to love painting and being creative, but I lived in a tiny flat in London and with my job, I was traveling the country a hell of a lot. So I got into cross-stitch because I could do it on the trains and on the bus and I could be creative, but I could also do this repetitive action which helped me de-stress, helped me have a think, helped me be creative, but in a small, achievable way. So when my life was pretty chaotic and manic, I could do this cross stitch which really helped me and I thought hang on a minute there's something about this craft that's really helping me sustain myself and um, think about issues be more strategic in what I'm doing because it makes me stop and think and sort of reflect on things which often we don't do when we're angry about an issue we just want to do something really quickly so at the same time I was trying to join lots of activist groups and I don't ride a bike so that made me feel like I didn't fit into some groups. <laughs> I love fashion madly and read Vogue every month and that also made me feel like some activist groups didn't really appreciate that. Um, I'm not vegan as much as I tried so I, I felt like I didn't fit into some of these groups and I thought this is awful that to make to change the world and be an activist you have to fit into a mould. Um, so I googled craft and activist I'm thinking I think this is a perfect fit so there must be some groups that I could join um, and this word popped up and it was coined by a woman called Betsy Greer in 2003 um, and she says craftivism is a way of looking at life with voicing opinions through creativity makes your voice stronger your compassion deeper and your quest for justice more infinite and I read that and thought brilliant this is what I'm going to be I'm going to be a craftivist I feel like I finally fit into something and it fits in with all the thoughts I had about about how craft could be used as an activism tool so I contacted Betsy who's based 
in Washington, D.C., and said, are there any groups I could join? Are there any projects I could do? And she said there weren't, and she was very much looking at craft groups, you know, having a safe space to talk to each other about issues and stitching things as anti-consumerist and, and all of those ways, but there weren't projects I could do. So I asked if I could come up with my own and check with her that it fitted into her definition, and we still keep in touch regularly, have good discussions. So my first project I came up with oh, my slides changed, um, was a mini protest banner. And all of the projects I do are very small. So it was very much a reaction to activism for me. So it was very much doing things small so you're not forcing people to hear what you've got to say. Every text that we have on it is not telling people what to do or shoving it in their face in a very negative way. But it's questions or quotes or facts or statistics to get people thinking but for them to take ownership of what they're thinking and what they've read and what that means to them and I started doing these little projects and I created a little blog called a lonely craftivist saying how I didn't fit into anything and I was basically testing out these projects and for people who weren't walking past to see it I thought it was another way to get it, the message out to other, other audiences and for people who saw it in the physical space it was in they could look at the little label look at it on Google and we had lots of hyperlinks to different campaigns I'd write about why I did it what my personal feeling was about a particular issue why I put it in the same place, um, what we could all do in a very holistic way in terms of what we vote for, what we buy, what we do locally, globally. And I'd have lots of hyperlinks to different campaigns or more information for people. So it's very much a landing place for people to know a bit more, but sort of take their own journey and see what they wanted to get out of it. So like Adam said, not telling people what to do, but slowly trying to let people find a place to, for things to grow organically. And then suddenly lots of people popped up going all over the world saying, I don't fit into activist groups either, or I love craft and I've wanted to use it for good, but I wasn't sure how to do it. Can I join in? And suddenly had hundreds of people around the world wanting to join in. So I couldn't say no. So I was like, okay, cool. So there was a... I don't know why these slides have changed, I'm going to go back. So we came up with a manifesto for the Craftivist Collective really early on, and it was all about making sure that we were talking about global human rights and global poverty issues, so we had a clear identity of who we were and weren't burning out doing, trying to do everything about saving the polar bear. So if we look at human rights and global poverty, we were looking at climate change, but the human impact of that. Um, so we were very specific on what we did, and we also said it was about public art um, and provoking discussion and thoughts, but in a non-threatening, non-violent way through public art and through street art. Um, so it was very clear what we did, so that people felt like they had a place for them to go to, and we we purposefully call it a collective so people do feel part of a collective but um, as you'll probably some of you know from my email out of office box it's me who does all the boring admin but we've got lots of people around the world who who get involved in our campaigns we do have lots of people who want to get involved and I'm lucky enough now that I'm a full-time craftivist and I run this as a social enterprise because there's lots of demand so I work with lots of art institutions lots of charities big and small groups, even corporate sometimes doing staff days with them. So I want to talk about some of the benefits of craftivism that I think is why people join us and why people see this as useful. I could talk for days about lots, but I'm going to try and limit myself and just talk about a few to get us all thinking. And the first one for me that really clicked with craft is it gave me time to reflect. In the busy world that we're in, it's really hard to stop and think before you do anything. And if you're really passionate about an issue, straight, you know, straight away you want to do something. And often that's not the best thing to do. You know, what you decide first isn't always the best thing. And often it's not at all. It might be the worst thing. So for me, when I was really passionate about an issue, I you know, wanted to go out and scream everyone and say, how are we letting this happen? But I know from my own experience, from people screaming at me, that that doesn't really work. It puts me off or I shut off and don't listen because I feel attacked. I also thought that as an activist and as an activist coordinator, often we do just do things. We say to people, OK, you want to be an activist? Do this, sign this, go to this march, hold this placard, do, do, do. And you don't really get time to think. So all of our craftivism is hand embroidery, it's not machine embroidery. It's very much doing a small repetitive action, so it's small and achievable, but it's always using your hands, so you're naturally in a meditative state to really think about those issues. 
We make little um, case studies for people and questions for them to really focus on the issue and not think about what happened in EastEnders yesterday, but focus on the issue and think about what it means to them. So what does it mean to them as a global citizen? What does it mean to them as a sister or a mother or in their workplace? What can they do as an individual and what can they do as a collective? So the first thing I thought was really powerful, the craft offers that I don't think other forms of activism do is that it gave people time to really stop and think and slow down. The second thing I noticed was when you're trying to engage influential people, again we know this in other parts of society that just talking at someone and telling them what to do doesn't mean deep engagement, doesn't mean that they'll change their hearts and minds. You have to have a respectful conversation, you have to understand them as an individual as well as what role they might be in as a Prime Minister or as a CEO of a company or as someone further down in that organisation. We have to understand people and we have to be respectful before we can be their critical friend and them with others as well and have that critical conversation try to improve things together. One of the things I did as a typical activist um, in my local area when I moved there was I contacted my MP with online petitions and paper petitions, signing lots of issues I really cared about, but not but just signing them. And she contacted me saying, stop it. Basically, she was like, this is a waste of your time. This is a waste of my time. And this is a waste of charity's money. And I thought, whoa, you're not a very good politician. It was a real shock to me that she just basically told me she wasn't listening. But it challenged me because it made me think, yeah, hang on, I don't know who you are. I've only met you once in a big group where we told you what to do. Um, I don't know what you're about. I don't, you don't know that I really care about these issues. I'm signing them really quickly, so it might look like I'm just being a clicktivist or a slacktivist and don't really care that much, but I really do care about these issues. So I decided to make her a handkerchief, as you do and stitch a message on for her that's very timeless and very positive and hopeful and all of our messaging has that approach. So it was saying to my MP, which has got her name, which I won't say it, um, all always about trying to, you know, I'm sure you're in this for the right reasons and being an MP is a really tough and a big job, but please don't blow it. Use your power and influence to help society, to help the most vulnerable um, and to really make a difference while you're in the position that you're in, yours in hope and my name and postcode so she knew I was a constituent and I asked to meet her and as an MP she has to so I went and met her and gave her this handkerchief and I didn't go in with a particular campaign ask, I went in and said you know, I'm a new constituent, I'm the one who's been emailing you all of these petition cards and this is what I really care about. And having that physical small piece of craft that was a little bit messy on the back so I didn't show my grandmother, she really opened up to me straight away. She didn't just shut down and say, oh my word, we don't have the same ideology and I'm not going to listen to you and you're just going to talk at me. She opened up, she read it, it was a timeless issue so we could have a really good conversation. I learned a hell of a lot being a lobbyist in that way than if I did it in another way. I learned about how she used to work for John Lewis, which is a cooperative, so I can talk about cooperatives and how brilliant they are and link that in with her old job. I found out about the passion she's got of working with local, local Somalian women and what the amazing stuff she does with them. Um, also about certain things we disagree on. I know what I can win on and how I can influence her and vice versa and how we can support each other and not. And I feel like without craft, I wouldn't be as effective as a lobbyist as I am. And it's a great way to turn other people into lobbyists without them realising. You know, it's really scary to go meet your MP, but to have a purpose with a physical thing to offer, it can really be a good bridge and a good stepping stone for people. The other thing is that as a campaigner, I felt like... Again, we were just talking at people. You know, we'd have big, enormous banners trying to engage people and raise awareness of certain issues. But I know personally, if I see a big banner, it scares me a little bit and I tend to walk the other side of the street and not look because it is so in your face. And we know that, you know, big advertising campaigns Lots of companies do it, but companies also spend a lot of money doing guerrilla advertising and, you know, having ambassadors and spokespeople. I think we've got a lot to learn in the NGO world on how to engage people, not in the obvious traditional ways. So all of our crafterism is very small. It's never on eye level. It's somewhere, you know, that you might not expect, but somewhere that links in with a particular issue it's on. So one of our mini protest banners is a quote from Martin Scorsese. So not from Gandhi or Martin Luther King. 
and it's, on, and it's talking about how violence doesn't solve anything, which for Martin Scorsese to say and young lads to hear, you know, it's a really good way to engage them in something that's relevant to them. And I put it in a, in a playground in Southwark where lots of um, older guys hang out and put it in the corner so they could find it and read it and discuss it and talk about violent films or whatever they were doing. But it wasn't preaching at them, it was just there. People can tweet it, people can Instagram it, people can have a conversation with someone saying, I just saw this really weird thing. And hopefully it brings up conversations and engages people much more deeply than just telling them what to think which actually stunts our growth, really. The other thing I found was, as an activist, and even now, you know, it's always a struggle to say, how do we get people from knowing about issues, which we all do now, really, with the powers of the internet and the news. It's, you know, we haven't really got the excuse anymore to say we don't know things, we can find them out. But how do we turn that into action? I cross-stitched this little message on the office um, where, I, where I am two days a week, and it's a great way for people to, to have a conversation and see it and go, OK, I'm going to do something after sitting in the office all day. The way we mobilise people is we don't tell people to join us. We sit in very small groups in public. We try and limit it to a maximum of 10 people, ideally about five people. And we just stitch whatever issue we're doing. So if we might be in a train station, if it's about the prices of train fares going up, which means that um, it's more expensive to travel. It means some people can't afford to travel. It means we're talking about how flights can be cheaper than getting on the train, which doesn't help with carbon emissions. So issues that look at lots of different elements because there isn't one size fits all in terms of you know, solutions to certain issues. And we'll sit and we'll stitch and we'll have a chat and we might have a cup of tea, as most crafters do. Um, and we won't say to people, I'm stitching, do you want to ask me a question and eyeball the wall? We'll just do it and often we won't talk to each other. But it means people naturally come up to us because we're doing something small. Craft is very beautiful, is naturally very soft and non-threatening. So people come up to us and ask us what we're doing and we can say, I'm stitching this, this is what we're thinking about, what do you think? And again, it really engages people. And we're not saying, join us now, sign this and join us or sign this and give us £2 a month they can say I want to join in and we'll tell them about it but we never proactively sort of recruit people in that way. Again we'll craft on our own as well on public public transport. I travel a lot with work now as well and whenever I craft on a train or a bus you know I'll often get people having a look and we can have a good chat. And I've had chats with retired bankers and judges and you know really interesting conversations with people. I also have a little suitcase which is around the corner for the activity later which says I'm a pop-up craftivist so I can hashtag pop-up craftivist on Foursquare, Instagram, Twitter and people can come find me. So I'm in New York next month and I'm going to do it in Union Square um, and see who comes. And we also work with institutions that you wouldn't expect activism to be. So not asking people to come to us as an activist community, which can be a bit of a bubble and a bit of a scary bubble for people. We go to places where you wouldn't normally find it. So we had 70 people on the roof of the Hayward Gallery when the Tracy Emin exhibition was on, because the Hayward Gallery asked us to do an activity as part of it. And for two weeks beforehand, people were tweeting, I'm going to go and see the Tracy Emin exhibition on the specific day that the craftivists are there, so I can stitch what I was thinking about the retrospect and we linked it in with a giant love letter about loving your global neighbour as well as your husband and your spouse and what that means to show your love because Tracy Emin's exhibition was all about love but it tends to be about her love for someone else or someone's love for her. It was very individualistic and it was brilliant because they'd never had that many people on the roof stitching away and it was just a lovely way for people to come together who might be nervous of activism and creep in and go I'm going to test this out and because it was craft it was a safe space for people to chat. And that links on to how, for me, craft is such a bridge builder with places that don't normally do activism. So without craft, we couldn't work with the Tate. We couldn't work with Secret Cinema, getting 5,000 people over four weeks to stitch messages, to link in with fine cell work and think about prison and think about if you were a prisoner, how could you deal with it? Look about how actually prison systems often a revolving door for certain people and why is that? And why do people commit crimes and how it really helps mental health and all of that stuff. We couldn't work with Tati Divine, which are a cult jewellery company, which any charity would die for the cult following that they have. You know, thousands of people like everything they do on Instagram. People, you know, 
their products often sell out and they have an enormous following and every year we work with them on Valentine's, uh, Valentine's Day where they design a little key ring for us all to make. And that's a brilliant way that craft can work with audiences that activism might not normally be able to tap into. And craft is also a great way to get into the media and not just into the places you normally see activism, but in places where you wouldn't normally. So O'Cumley magazine is a beautiful magazine for people who love fashion and illustration um, and storytelling. And they did a big feature on us, but also I had to create three craftivism projects people could do and they did these beautiful illustrations for it. And when you go through the magazine, it wasn't on the charity page of, you know, do your bit for the world on this page and buff up your halo. It was just in the magazine as part of how craft and art can do brilliant things. The same with Rewind magazine, which is for um, a free magazine in lots of trainer shoe shops for young people. We got stuff in there. We did stuff with MTV and we get into lots of craft books. Again, trying to make sure that activism is just threaded throughout our lives and not something to opt in and out of once in a while. It's always trying to remind people that we need to be our best selves. This is my trying to be my justification of how craft does make a difference. Um, as I said, we do everything very small, so it's non-threatening, but once a year, people really love being able to craft together and create something that they can look at and go, I was part of that. So this year, we worked with Save the Children to make jigsaw pieces around hunger because the G8 is hosted this year in the UK um, and we want to have hunger at the top of the agenda because hunger is one of the root causes of so much inequality and so much poverty in the world. So we got everyone to make jigsaw pieces and for us metaphors and words are just as important as the craft tool and to get people to think much more holistically about activism and what can they can do as a voter and consumer etc. So we asked everyone to be a piece of the solution rather than a piece of the problem and come up with their own little quote to basically say to the world leaders we care about this issue so should you. We've spent hours making these beautiful little pieces. We're going to keep one for us to have at home to remind ourselves to be a piece of the solution and not forget. One for our MP to build up a relationship with them and encourage them to be a piece of the solution. And one for this giant installation which we're going to tour around the country. And basically we've given it to the craft community to say where do you want it rather than create our own tour. And so far we've got over 700 jigsaw pieces just for the installation which you can see there which is bigger than that wall. So it's really beautiful when you see it and you know people I got a tear in my eye when I was reading people's messages and it's really powerful and it's all loose so it's not a big quilt so any venue it's in it, it's an installation so you can fit it to the shapes of the wall so you could have it around that arch or you could have it splattered in a corner and coming off and people can be really creative with how they want to set it up. Is this working? So, so far over the last four months, we've had 50 stitch-ins across the UK, which is what we call our little activities, um, which people have set up themselves. We've had over 700 jigsaw pieces in the installation, as well as others for their MPs and for themselves. We've had over 3,000 I'm a piece tweets. So people saying, I'm a piece of the solution. Here's what I've been making. What have you been making? Really having a conversation with each other. Um, that's not all just me tweeting 3,000 times, I promise. <laughs> We've been in print media, and again, not in the normal places you see activism, but in lots of craft magazines, in lots of fashion um, and arts and culture magazines. And we've had over 70 million um, reach on online media, which is pretty huge, really, quite scary. And again, it's all been people blogging about how they think about this issue. It hasn't just been a press release everyone's cut and pasted. It's very much been the voice of people feeling part of a movement and expressing themselves. And what I'm really proud of is that we've had over um, 170 craftivists meet their MP and any campaigner will know that's the hardest thing to ever get anyone to do. And I did have to hold a lot of people's hands and have lots of phone calls with people going, it's not that scary. And people really loved it and people got a lot out of it and now do meet their MP regularly, do see that they can make a difference. Um, and MPs have really said that this is a great way and a novel and an interesting way to engage them. Um, and I had a focus group with some MP staff in the Commons bar where I had to buy them drinks to get their feedback but very much saying that this is the way we need to think about you know how to do activism in a different way rather than just do lots of petitions and what I love really about 
craftivism is lovely things like this. I get lots of letters from people, lots of tweets and long emails from people saying what they get out of it. And this is just one quote, but it's a, a theme that comes out a lot, sadly. And it's by a lovely lady called Pippa Best. And she says, I love the project. It's really inspiring and creative. And it's really got me excited about activism in, again in the way that I haven't been since my teens. And I think that's a recurring theme is we are all passionate, but often we get really passionate and then we burn out and then we feel disillusioned and we don't know what to do. And I think craft, because it's sustainable, because it's slow and reflective and it's non-threatening and it's a beautiful thing to remind us that our world can be beautiful, it's a really good way to help people become healthy, happy craftivists rather than burnt out activists. Thanks. Thank you.